Mario and staff working on 2025, and they get a real good one this week. We will break it down right here at the Voice of College Football. Appreciate you stopping by. As always, hit that like button. Get that out of the way. You know you're going to enjoy it, so you might as well just tap that like button already. And uh, comments and questions are welcome. We always appreciate your support. You have been the best in regards to support. That's all I got to say for the history of this channel versus the others. That's Those are the facts. So thank you for that. And it's another Hurricanes Live right here at the Boys of College Football 371. And this is the guy that's responsible for 90-some percent of them, Cam Underwood, State of the U. Hey, Cam. Hey, hey, sorry. I <clears throat> just muted my microphone really quickly to cough. But yeah, tis I, tis I, here we are. Welcome back, one and all. Happy uh, Wednesday. Let's get it. So the commit this week is a highly productive running back out of uh, Sefner, Florida. In all our conversations, I don't know that you've stated the town of Sefner, Florida. I have in passing. We've had some guys like Ajay Hall um, uh, committed to Texas and then went to Alabama. He was a wide receiver a couple of years ago. Um, and also, if you went back maybe eight or ten years of super early on, they had a run of players. Um when they were kind of burgeoning powerhouse over there um, and everything. But yeah, not frequently that we've gotten to talk about them, but hey, we welcome change. Absolutely. 13th rated running back in the country, Gerard Pringle, 26th rated player in the state if we're going by the 247 Sports Composite and a number 220 next to his national ranking. What kind of back is he? Well, first of all, good one. This is a four-star running back, and this is uh, one of the first um, commitments for the new running backs coach. Forgive me. I forget his name. He was uh, from USF, uh, who's over here now. Um, but that is the um, – I'm going to just – Miami Hurricanes running – Ex coach, it's going to pop up. Matt Merritt, there we are. Um, coach Merritt over there. So, Armwood is on the Tampa side of Florida, uh, for those who are wondering geographically. So, this is someone that he's uh recruited and been around. Sefner is fairly local, uh, to the Tampa area. So, a guy with you know an Alabama offer, Georgia, and several others. So <clears throat> This is a guy that everybody uh, in America would take on their team. So if you're wondering about the caliber of player that we are adding to the running back room or to the commit list or either both, whichever way you want to look at it, and getting uh, Pringle Jr., uh, yeah, you're getting someone of, of high physical caliber. As a, as a sophomore – burst onto the scene 600 uh just over 600 yards at six a carry and six touchdowns um with 15 catches and a touchdown for armwood they went six and four that year in the 3m so whatever uh they redid the classifications to like metro and suburban or whatever think of 3m as what used to be the, the artist formerly known as 7a football in the state of Florida, which goes up to 8A in terms of, you know, the the size of the school and the ostensibly the caliber of competition with precious few uh, exceptions. I mean, I think like Miami Central's up in 3A now. You have Chaminade who's in 2A uh, and things like that. Um, but took that, was a district qualifier as a 10th grader in the one and 200 meter dashes, it doesn't say anything about 11th grade because he's running his current 11th grade track season right now, but he ran sub 11 um, at 1089 and 1097 a couple of times uh, in the 100 as a sophomore. So that's real good speed. And you see that speed coming to play on the field. Uh, this is a guy who's a one cut back. He gets north and south. And when he gets up the field, he gets missing to the tune of almost 1700 yards, 24 touchdowns on 7.7 .7 a carry. So we went from over 600 yards at six a carry to 1700 yards and 24 tutties on almost eight a carry basically. And then the team did better uh, with him stepping into a larger role, six and four as a sophomore, 10 and two in his junior year uh, and things like that. at Sefner Armwood, again, this is a, a, a school that has been 
a powerhouse for for many many years no thank you right now google because my chrome just updated it's giving me pop-ups of hey you want to try this new feature shut up and listen so yeah this is a guy who you know um he is a track guy with track speed and he plays like it now he's not the super duper duper track speedster like chris johnson or chris wheatley humphrey those guys are like a step faster because i mean like chris johnson he was multiple times state champion as sophomore and junior for a guy you know compared to someone who qualified from districts but didn't win regionals or states you know what i mean so uh maybe a half step slower than those guys but in terms of uh his play on the football field like i said you you saw a big step forward last season on the field hopefully he's able to continue that performance and continue to develop his body um Armwood is a public school, so that is one from which you can enroll early. Um, I don't know if he's going to. I uh, just want to throw that out there usually when we get our commits because there are certain schools, a la St. Thomas Aquinas, from which you are unable to earn enroll early because of some academic requirements. But all in all, Gerard Pringle Jr., big get, uh, you know, just continuing. So you already have a, a four-star recruit at quarterback in Luke Nickel, even though I know – well, did he get his update? I have to go look. Um, not overall, but yeah, he's going to be, yeah. So you got a four-star quarterback, uh, in Luke nickel from, uh, Milton, Georgia, led his team to a uh, state championship last year and over like slayed some big dragon teams on the way to that Wade and Charles, who's been on campus recently, several times looks every bit, the part of the six to one eighty five four star recruit that he's listed at, at from Palm beach central. And then you get Gerard Pringle at running back. Like you have the, the offensive triplets, you know, if you're a little older, like he, uh, you know, you remember they were always talk about that uh, in terms of uh, like the Dallas Cowboys, Troy Aikman, Emmett Smith and Michael Irvin. That was like the, one of the first ones I remember hearing being pushed as the unit of quarterback, wide receiver, running back in the public space in that kind of a way. But you already have some of those guys committed in this class, add in a four-star linebacker in Elijah Melendez, add in a big 6'6", 270 offensive tackle in Lamar Williams. The foundation of a really strong class is being laid here, adding Pringle Jr. only forwards that. And then, hey, also shows, you know, is – Matt Merritt able to recruit at this level and things like we were talking about when he got hired. You got a guy who's probably going to be an all American running back already committed in this class. That's the first big step forward. Uh, you know, six in the group already and we keep on marching forward, but yeah, really good get for Mario Cristobal and team. Falconer TRX keeping up the tradition of leading off the show with the super sticker. In red, I don't know if you get a chance or a choice there, Falconer X, with the choice of the color, but uh, he prefers the red, or maybe YouTube does, but we appreciate you, Falconer TRX. Thank you so much for being here, as always, and everybody else that is here. And uh, as Jackson uh, Johnson, who's a great supporter of the network here, the Voice of College Football, letting everyone know, hey, come on in, bring some folks. We just got started, so here we go. Well, I'm going to go straight to spring practice because there is little other news per se. But yeah. before I forget, this is a note that we should hit on. Our guy, Dylan Sherry, we will get to your question. We appreciate your contribution. We appreciate your question, but we want to give it its proper uh, weight and attention. So we will get to it sometime here in the next several weeks. But thank I mean, you for that. And honestly, probably like next week uh, and everything, I'm uh, – in the middle of one of the biggest weeks at the new secret day job, I've been working some, you know, 14 and 16 hour days uh, and everything. So yeah, I just didn't have time to get to that, but we will have that discussion. It was a really good question. I love that. Fred Langston, yo, NCAA, excuse me. That's EA sports college football, 25, uh, not branded as the NCAA game. You and me. Uh, I don't know if you're ready for the smoke, bro. I mean, I know that the hurricanes run through the smoke in real life and in the video game, but uh, I know that I'm built for it. I know that I got 10 toes to the ground. I'm not sure if you're ready for this smoke, but run up and get done up in July when the game drops, of course. And there's extra anticipation for this. So realize who you're talking to. I I gave my last serious 
attention to sports video games like in the early 90s. All right. And I was never like a video, what would you call that, head. Uh, but then when my kids were little, sure, I had a young son and he got into video games. So I'd play with him, Mario Kart and that kind of stuff. But in terms of like selecting teams and drawing up plays and all this. So what is the big hype around this game in particular? Number one, it's nostalgia because it was one of just the foundational games for those of us of, you know, a certain age. If you're, I mean, so the last game came out in 2013, in July of 2013 for the 2014 year. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you were up through college around then, like that was a game that was just, it was super community-based. Like everybody played it, everybody, you know, on your dorm, your floor, your friends group, your uh, fraternities, uh, you know, there were local tournaments, all kinds of places. A uh, friend of mine, well, not a friend of mine, but a guy I know through Twitter actually, um, is the reason that they changed the rules about subbing different players in uh, to for, like to base formations in the Madden tournaments. Uh, shout out to Francis in Maryland if, you're, if he's watching this. But then that actually trickled down to NCAA. But it was just just like you know Fred Langston. Like it was just it was bragging rights. Like it was easy. Everybody could you know you could have your favorite team. You could build up teams uh, and things like that. Um, and so yet not having that extra outlet and like Mark like on this channel um, and in your profession and everything like that passion that we have about college football you're able to have that at such a, a, a higher level because you can continue to run these things and recruit against whomever and you know uh customize your players and okay are they going to wear the armbands and the rainbow flare visors which were in the game and okay we're going to make this guy like this and that is just another thing it was just it was fantasy sports at your fingertips you know, and it's just, it was, there were just so many seminal moments for people in this game. I remember there was a kid who lived next door to me who made one of the most incredible diving interceptions on a play to beat me in our dorm floor tournament in the championship game. I had called a thing and I, I knew he was going to, it was almost like the Ed Reed play against Peyton Manning when he kept playing the coverage wrong. I had it dialed up just like Peyton. I was like, I got him. I saved this play to the last drive. And he made this play where he hit square and triangle at the same time and enacted this animation I had never seen before. And I was just, I mean, my mind was blown, but it won him the championship because it was the last drive, one of the last plays and things. And like, I am not talking to you from 2014 right now. I am sitting in his dorm room on the 12th floor of the Walsh Tower at the University of Miami in the Stanford Residential College. In I am there right now. And those emotions and everything coming back for all of us. And then like, imagine if you are a young college football fan. Imagine if you're a young Pittsburgh fan who was not even like a twinkle in your grandfather's eye for the Tony Dorsett, um, you know, Dan Marino years, and you want to have your team or lead to excellence, you can do that with a controller in your hand at your fingertips. You know what I mean? You could go and say, hey, I want to be uh, the next level of Mike Leach, God rest his soul, and we're going to run off 900 wins in a row at Washington State, right? You could do, All these possibilities are literally right there, and you get to have that again, not just with – because it's not the same as with Madden because the passion – that goes with the pageantry of college football is different and singular and finally getting able to being able to have that back. Oh man. Yeah. It's going to be great. And you already saw me start to talk my stuff, Fred Langston. He's not ready for the smoke and most of y'all aren't either. I, I might lose to a couple of y'all, but not many, but I mean, it's just, it's one of those things. It's going to be really, really, really great. I can't wait. Oh, I can't wait. I've already so told my boss that I'm taking time off after it drops. <laughs> so. Well, after some 14 and 16 hour days, you've earned it. So, Cam, getting back to this guy on Twitter, did he oh, yeah. basically break the game? Did he find a loophole that nobody else found? Yeah, so it was funny. Uh, 
long story short, he and I are big Bomani Jones fans. So this is back in the day of his uh, satellite radio show, The Morning Jones, that was on a television, uh, Canadian outlet and everything. And yeah, so Francis called in and he told this story about how he was in the Madden tournament and Francis from Maryland. So he's from Ma Maryland uh, and everything. So he would play with the uh, now commanders, you know, with their former uh, racial slur name. And he took Rod Gardner, I want to say it was, the receiver from Clemson. And uh, when he was in the league with the Washington pro team and he would go in and you, you I, the story as he told it was you got 90 seconds to make whatever uh, playbook alterations, whatever substitutions you wanted to do. Da, 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 da. And he put Rod Gardner at slot corner because their number three corner wasn't good. So he took the wide receiver, put him there. He did like a couple things and was beating everybody. And then before the, semifinals or finals at whatever tournament he was at, he saw the guys wearing the EA Sports um, event staff uh, shirts at the console on his side that he had been playing on in the tournament. So then he goes over there and then he goes to do the substitutions and whatever. Um, and I don't know what they coded or what they did, but he was not able to do what he had been doing and tells the story that when he looked over at the guys and it was just like, yo, WTF, are you all doing or whatever? They had that, you know, I'm ashamed. You know, when you scream at your dog because you're like, I came in, I know you didn't go pee in that corner. I know you did. And the dog will kind of cower and look away. It was like, that was kind of their general steez and everything. But yeah, the, uh, the, the rampant substitution, I think he, all the substitutions but one that he did were unable to be done from there on. And then that changed the landscape of substitutions and things in tournament play at venues for Madden from thenceforth. So short story long, yes, he broke the game and then they disabled whatever pathway he used to break it. Uh, and that changed the history of everything. Yeah. This is just a minimal connection to that, but it reminds me of a documentary I watched where there was a show called Whammy, and it was just basically a series of lights that would flash in various patterns. And mm -hmm. if you hit the, it was just a total guessing game. But some dude back in the early 80s had a VCR that was running like nonstop and recording, recording, and he was watching it over and over and he figured out the patterns. And so he went on the game and he just won like 20 some days in a row and they couldn't mm -hmm. stop him. And he just kind of, you know, he figured it out and they, they, the, it, and it was hilarious. I'm watching this documentary. I'm just splitting a gut because I'm watching this and just to, to be in the moment of them doing this show and the game show host is like, he can't believe that this guy is this good at it. And it's just, yeah. it's hilarious. Yeah. Press your luck was that show. Uh, and then it had the, the, either the numbers of the dollars and then yeah the if you got the x's or whatever was the whammy so everybody would always chant no whammies no whammies no whammies so if uh yeah and i remember that because i would watch that uh when i was in elementary school and i was sick and i would go spend time with my great grandmother but uh yeah you would have to go i know a lot of people were like pressure luck it, it was like in the 70s i think it ended in like 85 or 86 or something it was a show from a while ago but yeah it's the same kind of a thing he figured out the the secret sauce to it and they were like what is going on but yeah it was uh really interesting so yeah you and falconer tx trx uh filling in the blank for me there on press your luck yes that's right good stuff all right falconer trx had also made a comment about the quarterback play or at least what's being reported from spring practice. I don't know if there's anything necessarily fresh and new, but uh, I know that you've been fairly optimistic about what this quarterback room could possibly yield. Yeah, and I mean, it seems that that is what is being yielded. So um, we're taking the potential that we saw from before and turning it into performance, you know, relatively, obviously. It's not full go everybody live you know you tackle the quarterbacks to the ground or anything um but every single day every single person who goes to practice 
continues just to rave about Cam Ward. And, you know, also, if you remember, Miami did not have anyone wearing the number one jersey last year. And Mario said, y'all got to earn that. And he steps in. I think that was probably part of the negotiation to come here. He's like, hey, I've worn number one everywhere I've been. Give me the number one jersey on offense. And then Kiko Mawinoa, the linebacker, switched from 51 to one on defense. So, like, elite players. But he continues to flash. Jakari Brown continues to show improvement on accuracy. And if that takes hold, right, if that actually is a a change that stays moving forward, that, again, just speak, that that's such a huge thing because he has all of the physical tools in the world but if you can put the ball where he needs and wants it to go intentionally then you know you really have a real live four-way battle next year with Poffenbarger, Jakari, Emery, and Judd Anderson coming off of a red shirt because he's definitely going to red shirt as the fifth quarterback in the room like you know you you have the kind of talent that you need and want, and they're playing like it. And again, I made the analogy of KJ Osborne teaching the wide receivers uh, previously here at Miami how to be professionals and go about their craft. KJ Osborne is still in the league and just signed a new deal with the New England Patriots. So he's doing it at the next level and had a great five year run in, or four year run, excuse me, in uh, Minnesota. Like you're seeing that same thing with Cam Ward just going about his business and it impacting and improving what we're seeing at quarterback. I mean, it's the most important position on the field. I mean, every position is important, but you know, you, I mean, we've seen teams go as quarterbacks go and hopefully uh, this is something that's able to continue moving forward. So I am super duper, 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 duper excited about it, but Take everything with a grain of salt. And as um, I believe it was Mike Tyson said, everyone has a plan till they get punched in the face. And I say that to say it's easy on air to work on your long delivery and your accuracy and everything. Remember we heard that about Tim Tebow in the NFL? Oh, no, he's sitting there and dotting it up all of a sudden. Yeah, and he's taking that super <laughs> – I love – I got baseball right here. Baseball is my favorite sport in the entire world. I was just not very, I mean, I was not as good at it as others, but I got a baseball on my desk every single day. And he had that long windup and everything. But remember, in, after the, they, I don't even know how, but won that playoff game coming back uh, after that year, he said, oh, yeah, no, he's, well, you know, precise with his passes. He looks like left handed Kurt Warner out there. He has a strong army. Da, 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 da. And all of a sudden, when those pass rushers got in his face, what happened? We the same Tebow we had seen before and the same kind of release, which was long, and the same kind of issues that had been told to have been worked out. He, I mean, it wasn't a punch. He got tackled, you know, but the metaphorical punch of the face came and then he went back to being that same dude. We shall see if that is what happens with all of these quarterbacks that are not Cam Ward, uh, but particularly Jakari Brown. But uh, what we are seeing and what has you know been done so far is a step in the right direction, and hopefully we keep that going. You know what was funny about Tim Tebow was during that run with the Broncos, and you'll recall this. He went on like a eight or nine game streak where he didn't statistically do much of anything. The defense was winning the game, but he was making like one or two plays at the end of the game to win the game. And they won like eight or nine games in a row and they weren't supposed to make the playoffs. And he takes them into the playoffs. Then he pulls off that overtime game against the Steelers. Mm -hmm. And then they get brought down to earth against uh, the Patriots the next week. If you look up Tim Tebow's career record as a starting quarterback in the NFL, it's, it's not just otherworldly, but it's rather impressive for a guy who never got another opportunity to be, to be a starting quarterback in the NFL because people knew, okay, he just caught a streak and he had the defense and, you know, he's not a starting quarterback in the NFL, but his, yeah. his, his career records like 13 and eight or something. But yeah, they're, they're kind of crazy, but speaking yeah. of which our guy, George has calculated the <laughs> exact time to the Florida kickoff in the swamp. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure that they have a running timer. Um, 
you know, just like Michigan and that school in the state south of Michigan have towards that game and whatnot. And Texas and Oklahoma and USC, UCLA. And, you know, there, there's so many of these rivalries where it's like, yeah, you go into the facility. It's just like, how long until? Oh, okay, cool. And you just, it's plastered on the wall. I'm with it. I'm here for it. And that's okay. Um, I don't know. It, it does feel weird that uh, George is counting down to his team's impending doom because we're about to go into Gainesville and whip that ass. But if you want to, if you want to worry about the train coming down the tracks the entire time while you're standing there, it, that seems anxiety riddled to me. I wouldn't want to do that. But hey, if that's how you deal with what's about to happen, go right ahead. George, we love you, but I got to think that if you're a Florida football fan, I cannot think of another big time fan base. You know, if you're rooting for Illinois or something, that's one thing. Big time fan base that has less to be optimistic about this year. Not that they don't have some talent, but with that schedule, I got to think that the the attitude and the level of optimism of that fan base coming into the season has to be lower than anybody i mean there's that and then there's also just false bravado where it's just like yeah we know that it's going to be but, but like i'm we're just gonna you know fake it because i don't think that they're gonna make it and then it just came out uh that the sec is can are maintaining an eight game schedule moving forward into next year uh and they're not redoing the matchups. So the schedule that you have this year for every single team is getting mirrored in terms of home and away next year. So even if you are a Florida fan and thinking, okay, cool. Look, we got jobbed. We have such a hard schedule, but that's okay. We're look, hang the losses on Billy Napier this year, fire him. I don't think that he's making it till, you know, He's not he he's not making it to November, in my mind. Honestly, I don't if he makes it to November, you keep him the whole entire season, but I don't think he makes it to November. I don't think he makes it to Halloween, right? But if he doesn't make it to Halloween, there's or you know, it's cool, whatever. Maybe we just bring him back, hang the losses on him, bring in whoever else, and then move forward. Da, da, da. And then the, and then the conference is like, cool. Yeah. So if you thought that you could just hang the losses on your ostensibly lame but lame duck coach who won two recruiting battles now they were big ones for lj mccray and uh the quarterback willis right um but that and pretty much nothing else right so you hang the losses on him bring in whoever else and you go forward with the new group of opponents in 25 psych no you got the same opponents just flip where they play except for the largest outdoor cocktail party which is in jacksonville in the state that you want to run and Georgia just comes down, uh, you know, I, I 95 and whoops your ass over there every single year. So like it, if you were looking forward to be like, fine, we'll take our lumps in 24, get rid of Billy Napier. And it'll be a new day and a new horizon in 25. That horizon is going to be like Tom Hanks and groundhogs day, baby. Y'all going to wake up and face the same gauntlet all over again. Yikes a million. And you love that. I look, look hey, the, <laughs> absolutely. This is uh joy and, and 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 just sheer excitement on my face. I love them going through all of that. And they did get jobbed by the cadre of teams that were put on that schedule for next year. I would love it if the ACC went back and made a similar move and just said, hey, you know what? We're going to give the Miami Hurricanes this same cakewalk kind of schedule in 25. We gave them 24, but no, no schedule is a cakewalk if you keep tripping over your own two feet, Miami. So let's get it together, please. And then I can really, really, because imagine, imagine what I could do or say if we were like a 10 or 11 win team and they, and at the same time they were having the futility that I think they could have, this would be, you remember um, in 2000 and what was it? It was 2016. Notre Dame went four and eight and everybody was talking about Notre Dame. 
and we couldn't because we were one of the four teams that they beat. And I had to say it was like the Simpsons uh, meme with Bart like upstairs after a broken leg looking at everybody playing outside. And I'm like, everybody's tap dancing on Notre Dame's grave right now. Everybody's calling them trash. And I can't do that because as soon as we came, I'm like, ah, yeah, they're four and eight. It's like the uh, middle school lunchroom when people are getting roasted and all of a sudden the funniest kid in class says, I know you ain't talking and I'm not going to step out for that because I already see how that's going to go. So please do what needs done and I can really enjoy that after August the 31st. Thank you. That Miami team was nine and four. That was Rick's first team. It was and lost four in the middle in October to it was either the month of October or one month in, or one week in October into November in the middle of the season. And that was when after losing to Florida State for those years, this is where that phrase of don't let them beat you twice or three or four or five times because they would beat us. And then we would lose, 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 lose consecutively. It wasn't even like a one week hangover. It was like a month hangover. But yes, a nine and four team that won that bowl game in Orlando and da 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 da. And played well and set the stage for, you know, what happened next in 2017. Yeah, all of that being true. But when it came to Notre Dame, we couldn't say anything because we lost to those bombs. I do anticipate a close game and a good game. Like my my confidence level, and we're talking in March about right. a game in August. But anyway, mm. my confidence level of Miami winning the game is extremely high, but by some blowout or decided figure is not mm. so high. That's fair. Yeah, I, I can see that. Um, I think that the talent is there for it to happen, but uh, we will need to kind of show and prove, uh, you know, maybe get a couple turnovers to be able to, you know, uh, get that the margin of victory up a little bit. But yeah, I don't think that you're completely off base with that, but uh as I continue to say, by one or a hundred, as long as we have more points than them at the end of you know sixty minutes, that's the result that we need. Falconer TRX, yes, uh, reminding George, yes, that uh, the loss is uh, one hundred and forty nine days away. Uh, Falconer TRX, we appreciate your comments. Of course, you're amazing. I, I'm going to let this comment. I'm just going to let it. We'll post it. I'm not going to read that off. All right. Falconer's coming back with Cam. Who is the number one wide receiver this year? In terms of. I think that you have two different things. I think that like statistically in terms of catches and maybe yards, I think that you could still run it back with Xavier Restrepo. Like, <clears throat> I think that this is a guy Going back to the earlier conversation, right? I think that he's going to have a 95, 97 catch rating in the upcoming college football video game. You know, um, maybe a 88 to 93 catch in traffic. Like, you know, route running is really good. You know, if you, <clears throat> when you play with the Hurricanes, I would say put him on a lot of option and whip routes because he runs those routes really well. He's quick in and out of his breaks. He catches damn near everything. So statistically, I think that he's going to be able to have another big season. But in terms of being like wide receiver one, like on fourth in the ball game, regardless of where you are, regardless of the situation, I'm throwing to him. I think that the only candidate currently on the roster, I think there are two. I think there's one that's likely, and I think that there's one that's possible because of talent, but maybe not because of game experience. The likeliest one is Isaiah Horton because he has redone, built his body. He is looking like he is taking a step forward, uh, switches number to number two. And again, at the beginning of spring practice, most everybody looked at him the first couple of days in shorts, uh, in shorts uh, jerseys, and helmets and said, who is that? Looked like a tran like a different guy. And at 6'5, pushing 200 pounds, already showed the ability to run by guys. You know, he was all state in Tennessee in high school and everything, had big time potential, but looks like he's finally stepping into not just that potential, but also has that body type of a guy who can box somebody out, who can just be the 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 player. You know, you, you have 
you know, player plays or like him plays, he looks like he could physically fit that mold and then have the talent to do that. So I think that that's your likely number one wide receiver in that kind of guys. The other one is Jojo Trader, who is, I mean, every day just doing crazy stuff. You see these pictures and these still shots um, from practice and he's just, you know, showcasing this elite vertical that he has. He's, and again, He's so talented, and even the All-American game, he's making these circus catches, one hand behind his back, twisting, turning, all kinds of stuff like this, that the other All-Americans are like, okay, wait, let me try to figure out how to do that. And he's just like, it's how you do it. He, you know, he JoJo Trader's skill is like Matt Damon's brain and goodwill hunting. Where he like, you know, he saw the super duper advanced calculus as like two plus two. And, you know, there's other grad students and other professors like, well, how do you just like, I just do it. Like I see the numbers and like it gets done. And that's Jojo Trader's skill in that way. Now he needs to develop physically. He needs to get experience at that level. But for like a ready-made package towards wide receiver one, I say Isaiah Horton, the potential and skill I think are there. Um for just like the the tricks and the athleticism and all that kind of put together for Jojo Trader, uh, but in terms of like sheer raw number of receptions, would not surprise me for Xavier Restrepo. But again, I do believe that like those are two different things from like leading in terms of catches versus having the stature of the number one wide receiver in the offense. So I don't see any other news items we need to get to or no other uh, questions or comments here. So I'm going to run something by you here, Cam, and and we'll see what your response is to it. So I did my annual offseason coaches rankings nationally. Now, I leave out the group of five coaches, rank them separately. I just think it's a completely different deal. So there are 69 in the power five or what is now the power four, 69 head coaches. So before I show you my list, because I don't think it's fair without context Mm. and you seeing who could possibly be above or below Mario to just spit out a number, but what would be your estimation on where he ranks? Not necessarily guessing where I would rank him and do rank him, Mm. but your estimation of where you would place him among 69 power conference coaches first of all nice um i would say kind of taking all the parts and pieces and putting them together like i think that he would be you know he's top 10 probably top five if we just look at recruiting in a vacuum But if we marry that with on-field performance, obviously there's much to be desired um, in terms of his operations um, on-field and decision-making in certain moments. So if you, which I think would probably put him lower than you would think uh, on that list, I would say, you know, probably top half, I think like comfortably top 30, maybe pushing top 25. So if you take those two things together, I would say in that 20 to 25 range um, kind of fits. There's a lot to like and the potential to move up just because his talent acquisition is elite. But even with that, uh, yeah, his personal operations and some of the decision making and just, you know, some of the things that ails him as a coach, you know, like, you know, it's. It's funny, you know, Oregon fans loved him and were saying there's no way that he's leaving here to go back there. And, da, da, da. you know, even though they'd lost, you know, Willie Taggart uh, from there to Florida State because, you know, he's a Bradenton native, you know, which is in the Tampa area and everything. He's a Florida State fan forever. I mean, Cristobal played here. He's Greece from here. You know what I mean? Um, so you lost back to back coaches to the state of Florida. And it was we have it great here, you know, uh, couple Rose Bowls, Pac-12 championship, recruiting at an elite level, got some guys that, you know, Miami wanted even in like your Justin Flows of the world and guys like that. So why would he go there? Because he can recruit the guys here and blah, blah, blah. And it turned from that to we hated him and everything. 
No, y'all didn't, because you were saying we just won 12 games and we accomplished this and achieved that. Da, da, da. And so it was, it was interesting to see the flip up. But I will say that when they brought up some of these issues with game operations and whatnot, um, they were not necessarily wrong. So I say all that to say somewhere, it wouldn't surprise me if he was slightly above 20, but because of recent performance, I would say not too much higher, but that's kind of my evaluative process as you asked me that. So to set up how I look at it before we get to my list, number one, it's not a resume ranking, meaning let me go to the, the the biggest extreme example. If Bobby Bowden and Joe Paterno were coaching right now, but they were in their final seasons, I would not rank them like top two or three coaches in the country just because they are all time. Yeah. I would be ranking them on their current. If I was having a draft, who am I going to? I'm not, you know, they're, they could be like number 30. Uh, because I'm not ranking them based on their legacy and their greatness in their prime. Number one, number two, it's obviously this more so than any other sport, especially of course in, in the professional ranks, there's such a disparity of resources and brand that to rank and rate and evaluate a coach who is coaching an elite program fill in the blank versus somebody toiling at Oregon state or Washington state or somewhere like that SMU. It's a very difficult thing to do to a certain extent. So I'm not rating necessarily ranking their success level of success. I'm trying to gauge, okay, what, what do they have to work with and how well are they doing? But, and, and I'm doing an in the moment ranking, um, and then one other caveat before I'll throw it out there. So an extreme case would be David Braun at Northwestern did a remarkable job, like an otherworldly job. Thanks. So if you're taking my ranking system to an extreme, you could say he did the best job of anyone in the country. Therefore, he is the number one coach in college football. Well, I'm being more nuanced than that than to just say, well, he did the best job. He's number one and it's in the moment ranking. All right, here's where I've got uh, Cristobal. I've got Mario Cristobal at number 38 in the country, down from 31. Okay. Okay. And to that point, David Braun of Northwestern, again, he's only coached one season, and I've got him at 39. Uh, like, like, look at the contrast of Greg Schiano and Mario Cristobal. It's, you know in terms of what they have to work with and resources and school and brand and all that, mm -hmm. it, that there's, there's that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Bill O'Brien hasn't coached a college football team in over 10 years. Mm -hmm. Um, so I had to give that, uh, the rest of this business is just my notes. Uh, okay. So, okay. so those are my thoughts. I've, I've got guys like, uh, Sonny Dykes and Gus Malzahn, Brett Bielema, just slightly ahead of Cristobal, and I, I, he took a hit seven spots based on last season's performance in my book, and and that's fair, you know, um, you know, in in the in the scheme, uh, I did think, like I said, uh, you know, that maybe a little bit lower than than before, um, but yeah, um, I. Yeah, I mean, I think that he can go up just, you know, uh, like pretty far. Uh, but again, we have to win the games. So that's a, a big part of it. Um, interesting, you know, different different view. I would have to see, you know, even more. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not totally crazy, I don't think. Yeah, look at those two, two top uh guys there, Dave Clawson and Matt Campbell, they're at Wake Forest and Iowa State. Mm -hmm. But they're really good coaches. Fact. But, uh, yeah, I, I get interesting comments from viewers about Mario Cristobal. And as I am apt to do when it's a Miami fan that's trying to sell him, I tend to pull back on his disappointments. But 
people because of the record at Miami 12 and 13, everybody else in college football tends to crap on him. And then I pull them back to the middle to say, eh, look at the recruiting and look what he did at Oregon. And the, the job's not done at Miami. So. And I mean, yeah, all, all those factors are true. You know, I know it's not a lifetime achievement award ranking, but like the fact that he has recently accomplished these things does matter and, and whatnot. So, yeah, I mean, that's not, Entirely crazy. Again, in my quick thoughts, a touch lower than I would put him, um, <clears throat> but not crazily so. And again, if you want to move up the list, go win the games. Starting on my cousin's birthday, August 31st, in Gaines, Alachua County, uh, you know, against them people, um, and and go from there. Um yeah, if if uh, this was a resume ranking based on accomplishments, he would be far higher on that right. list. He'd be in the top 12 or 15, if not higher. All right, uh, Falconer TRX, what do we have here? Will the ACC collapse this year if three teams leave? I mean, I don't – it's, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough moving forward. Uh, I was listening to another podcast, and um, when they brought up the fact that the SEC – took the let me be judicious let me be let me be nice with my words for once though when they took the path of least resistance in terms of continuing an eight game schedule instead of going to nine and just mirroring the schedule uh, home and away for the 25 season um yeah the guys on that podcast were like oh yeah like you know we're making fun of them making fun of them but pragmatically that's something that you do when you think that you're going to expand so you're going to have to redo the 25 schedule anyway so like why go over the work to do something new because you're looking at what's happening with florida state and clemson and the acc uh and everything and it was funny mark the day after we recorded last week dan radikovich was asked about uh you know where things stand with miami and whatnot and uh in, in terms of the conference and he said exactly what i've been saying look we're taking the path of letting the other public school, letting those public schools take the PR hit, let them do the grunt work, and we'll figure out where we go from here. Like, the, it is known that we do not enjoy being in the ACC. We know that there are many, many gripes, but, like, they're going to be the loud ones about it. They're spending the money to sue the conference. They're talking about all these things. They're trying to get the grant. Because if Florida State were to have gotten the grant of rights document, unsealed to the point where like everybody would have had access to it. And you could have then finally had a copy on site in Coral Gables, as opposed to the one copy, like the declaration of the original declaration of independence, you know, that lives in one place and you have to go visit it and not even have a, like, we don't even have, I have the opportunity to have a reprinting of the grant of rights, but if Florida state would have won that motion. Right. And then everybody could have, then Miami could have had one also. So like they're doing the work and then we're reaping the benefit, but also setting up what strategically where we're going to go moving forward. So I said all that to say, it'll be interesting to see how those things work out. And if Miami is one of those teams and schools that moves forward strongly towards another conference. And again, I think that that uh, academic school rating that we attain, obtained recently, the AAU, um, that is something that points us towards the Big Ten because every member institution before the expansion this year, or even with it, I believe, is a member of that prestigious academic cadre. So, like, our profile is rising in terms of that. So we're making ourselves, uh, you know, available there uh, and everything. And, like, what will happen with, uh, you know, the whatever is left of the ACC, they're going to have a real a real big question for them. So could it collapse? Absolutely. It'll be very interesting to see how these legal battles work because yeah, Florida state and Clemson they're they're screaming about it, but trust and believe everybody is look. I mean, you think that the university of North Carolina, another top 10 academic institution, a public academic institution, isn't looking and seeing what's going on. You think that the university of Virginia who like, yeah, I do not like, uh, you know, their athletics or anything, but like, that's another fine research institution. So they say, Hey, we would fit in the big 10, you know, uh, on across the the sports landscape, I know that Miami is looking at that, uh, you know, and everything. So it will be very, very interesting. But um, yeah, it 
Will it? I'm not sure, but like you take Miami, Clemson, Florida State out of the universe of the ACC, and that is nowhere near the conference that it is even today. And I know that the ACC fancies themselves like this wonderful basketball conference and whatnot, but like even with that, I think that you see a, a step down uh across the board you know even in in some of the the other sport i mean what florida states won uh championships in women's softball in well no they yeah they did uh soccer you know what i mean like clemson has competed in other non uh you know revenue sport miami has had national champions in track swimming and diving uh estella perez somariba with the singles tennis championship you know what i mean like there have been like sports that are not necessarily just football and things that are, you know, extend further than just that one dimension that uh, if you remove that from the universe of the ACC would be big, 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 big holes to replace. So we'll see. I've got a little pushback on that question, but we're going to table that because we're going to get going. We're going to let Kim uh, tell us what's at uh, state of the U. Man, just transitioning into the spring, having some really great conversations. Justin Tatavio, uh, Kappa Kane, uh, Craig T. Smith, Mike Schiffman, all in there with everything. I know that I keep saying I need to let my fingers do the walking, and I promise that I will after this week because I have another 16-hour day ahead of me tomorrow. So we're going to run and get out of here, but stickwithyou.com is where you can go find us. Please come fan with us, and also please come back here next week, Wednesday. Bring a, fr- fa- uh, bring a friend, a fan, or a foe because, hey, George needs some help in there. You know, he's uh, he's – He's Jon Snow against the Ramsey Bolton army in Game of Thrones and that, you know, one uh, great scene where, you know, he's fallen off of his horse, he draws his sword, and there's the force of a thousand going just against him. This is before the Knights of the Vale and everybody else show up. But in that moment when he's there, ready to go to war, him versus a thousand, imagine what it would be like if you brought in, if he brought a couple friends and you brought another couple friends to trample them down. So do that. We'll be here next week, Wednesday. I'll see you then, and it'll be great. Let's go, Kings. Falconer TRX, uh, my apologies for blowing through your last few super chats. We did post them on screen. Yes, I know that I screwed up on Mario's ranking and he is bringing culture and consistency. Yes, gotcha. We will see you next week. Falconer TRX and everybody else, thank you for being here. Do all those things that Cam just recommended and we'll see you back here next Wednesday, 7 Eastern.